Today is Tecla Tech Talk, Episode 2. Hello, and welcome to C.S. Wilson Draws. I'm C.S. Wilson, and in this Tech Talk, I'll show the keyboard and mouse that I use for Tecla structures and talk a little bit about the pros and cons for each. I'll also show how I start and set up a model and how I use the firm folder. Then I'll wrap it all up with a how-to on how I handle and draw gusset plates. All of that and more, there's a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Obviously, we all have and are familiar with keyboards and mice. They're the most common and basic of all the input devices, but arguably the most important. Over the years, there have been many variations and combinations, some that were good and some that weren't. It boils down to the best keyboard and mouse are the ones you have, but there's always room for improvement. A few months ago, I upgraded my Logitech K320 keyboard with this Corsair K95 mechanical keyboard. I wanted to get a mechanical keyboard for its durability and key action, and I chose this one for its 18 programmable G keys, which I use for Tecla Structure's keyboard shortcuts. For me, it's much nicer to have them all in one place right next to my left hand, which is normally resting on the keyboard. Now, this keyboard is normally marketed for the gaming community, but it works perfectly fine for production as well. Using the program that comes with the keyboard, you can set each G key to match the keyboard shortcut you define in Tecla Structures. You can also launch external applications, create your own macros, and even set a timer. All of these things can be set up and saved in different profiles, which is handy if there's more than one user or if you want the keyboard set up differently for another application. I also upgraded my mouse from a Logitech M510 to a Logitech G900. The G900 is hot swappable between cordless and corded operation. In cordless mode, it uses a built-in rechargeable battery that lasts for about 25 to 30 hours of use, depending on how you have it set up. When plugged in, it operates normally while simultaneously charging the battery. There were two main reasons why I upgraded to this mouse. Number one, better tracking resolution, also known as higher DPI. And number two, the addition of two right side buttons. Let me explain. In the model, the middle mouse button, which is usually found by pressing down on the scroll wheel, is used to pan around your view. When you hold the control key and the middle mouse button, you orbit around your view. It's more ergonomic for me to do this all from the mouse, so using the Logitech software, I remapped the thumb button or the left side button to emulate the control key on the keyboard. I hold the thumb button or left side button and the middle mouse button and now I'm orbiting. I've also found it to be more ergonomic if I set the right side buttons up to emulate the middle mouse button. Now if I want to pan, I use the right side buttons and if I want to orbit, I use the left and right side buttons. No keyboard interaction required. So here are the pros and cons. The pros for the keyboard are its durability and feel or responsiveness of the keys plus the additional 18 programmable keys that can be programmed in just about any way imaginable. For the cons, the big one would be price. This one is a lot more expensive than the traditional membrane style keyboards that you can find just about anywhere. Although there are many other keyboards that have similar features that are much more moderately priced. It all depends on how much bang you want for the buck. Also, if you're not used to typing on a keyboard that has mechanical switches, it can take a little getting used to, but it's not too bad. Turning to the mouse, the pros are higher DPI resolution for better accuracy, left and right side buttons, and the ability to program all of the buttons to just about anything you could want. I also like the interchangeability from being a corded mouse to a cordless mouse, although with my setup, I didn't notice any difference in performance whether it was plugged in or not. For the cons, again, the main one is price. It's an expensive mouse. We'll just leave it at that. I also found that the middle mouse button on the scroll wheel to be fairly stiff and somewhat difficult to press a thousand times a day when using it in Tecla structures. That was another reason I assigned the right side button to emulate the middle mouse button. As far as the RGB lights on the keyboard, mouse, and yes, even the mouse pad, I have to admit those are guilty pleasures. Man cannot live on bread alone. He must have peanut butter and a little jelly. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about how I set up and use the model and firm folders for all of my projects. These may not be the most elegant solutions, but if you're fairly new to Tecla Structures, it may give you a few ideas on how to get started on setting up your own projects. I normally start a project by using a model template I've created that contains all of my typical information and program settings. Actually setting up and creating a model template is outside the scope of this video, but may be the topic of a future video. Basically, you create a model, configure all the options and settings, then save as a model template. Inside each model folder, I keep and maintain all of the templates and reports for that model. That includes title blocks, bill of materials, and client information, as well as material lists, bolt lists, and other custom information that's required for each individual project. So all of those stay with the model, in the model folder, forever and always. For all other Tecla Structures save settings, I use a firm folder. Basically, this stores all of your generic and typical information, as well as save settings for components, objects, and drawing entities that you can use for all of your projects. An example of this would be the settings for my standard text heights. I generally use four, small, standard, large, and extra large. Those are always the same, and I don't want to have to set them up every time for each project. So I store them in the firm folder to be used with all projects. I also consider these to be one-shot settings. In other words, once you use a setting to create, for example, a piece of text or a beam or to insert a component or add a part mark, the setting you used is no longer associated with that object. You can immediately change that setting or even delete it, and it doesn't change any of the things that you've created with it. Templates and reports, on the other hand, are different. For example, if you have one title block that you keep in the firm folder that you use for all of your projects and then later decide to change or make modifications to that title block, it may not work very well with your older projects. In addition to that, from my standpoint, title blocks and bills and materials tend to vary from client to client. So keeping them with the model makes them easier to organize. So decide on a good place to keep your firm folder. It should be handy. I keep mine in the Windows Documents folder just to make it easier to access, but you can store it anywhere on your system. Define that location in Tecla Structures by setting the advanced option Excess Firm found under File Locations. You can also set the Excess Firm in the Options.ini file found in the Model folder as well. I've gradually built mine up by creating certain settings and then saving them. Then in the Model folder, I go into the Attributes folder, find the save setting, and then copy that to the attributes folder of the firm folder. Collecting all the settings I have now has been a process, and I have to maintain the firm folder by clearing out the clutter every now and then. But I think it's worth it because my attributes folder is around 12 megabytes right now, which would be a huge waste of space if I kept that with each model. If you'd like to see more about how I have my system set up, such as my model template, advanced options, plotting configuration, user-defined attributes, templates, reports, and so on, leave me a note in the comment section below this video. If there's enough interest, I'll make a video about it. Or probably a series of videos. For the how-to segment, I want to show how I handle gusset plates, primarily for diagonal bracing. And just a couple of things before we get started. I think it's relevant to note that I don't generally use Tecla structures to automatically dimension and note my drawings. There usually ends up being a few automatic dimensions here and there, and I'll keep some and delete others and then add back my own. I mean, the dimensions and notes that I want usually vary from project to project, so how could I expect Tecla to know what I would want when I don't really know myself until I see the situation? So as a general rule, I like to dimension and note the drawings myself, as you'll see in this example. To start, I've already modeled in a WT 4x9 diagonal brace that goes between a beam and a column. The endpoints have been placed to reflect the control points for the brace. Looking at the 3D view, you can see that the endpoints for the brace are on the center of the members. Since I know the gusset plates will be 3 8 inch thick, I want to move the brace back half that thickness, or 3 16 of an inch, so that the gussets will be centered on the members. Next, I select bolted gusset number 11 from the component catalog in the US Imperial environment, load some settings I've stored previously, making sure the plate thickness is set to 3 8 inch, and apply it to both ends of the brace. Now, at this point, I could just leave everything the way it is. 
just walk away and move on to something else. But I see a couple of things about these connections that I want to change. I want to get rid of these infinity points and make the plate size more even. I would also make the brace length more even by removing the 16th out of the dimension as well, but this example is focusing on the gussets, so I'll leave that as is. This is just an example, but in real life, I would definitely be changing that. I haven't been able to find a way to get the component to incorporate these changes automatically when it's created, but that's okay. I normally use the components as a starting point anyway and rarely leave them intact. To get started with the changes, I'll first explode the components. Doing this leaves little red points all over the place which are tied to the bolts and are highly annoying. You can get rid of these by first double clicking on the bolts to copy their properties and then delete the bolts. I then clear out any offsets and use the bolt command to reinsert them. Now I want to take care of the actual plate size and this infinity point. After taking a few measurements, I determine the new plate size I want, 9 by 1 foot 1 in this case, and draw construction lines to guide me. To clip that infinity point off, I like to be at least a half inch away from the welded surface. I need to create a new point on this plate, and a quick way to do that is to enable direct modification, grab a midpoint, and drag it out anywhere. Disable direct modification, and then you can move the new node precisely where you want it. I'll then move the other points to slightly adjust the plate size, and that finishes up this operation. So now let's move on to the drawings. We'll start with the general arrangement drawing. Here I have a view showing the brace condition. I turn the reference line on for the brace, and since I modeled it so its endpoints are the same as the control points, I can easily dimension to them. In addition to that, I can also throw a note on it using a part mark. This is one I already have for gussets. Moving on, I've loaded up the assembly drawing, which in this case is the beam. Now, this is normally what I get when I create my assembly drawings, at least for beams. There's pretty scant information generated, and that's intentional. As I've said before, I like to manually dimension my drawings. So I'm not really going to go over the whole assembly drawing, I just want to focus on the gusset plate for now. And to start, I want to show the center line of the bracing. To do that, I open the view properties and click on neighbor part. I have a save setting for this, but I'll quickly show how I set it up. On the Visibility tab, set the neighbor parts to connected parts and the main secondary parts to main parts. In the Content tab, everything should be unchecked except the main beam part reference line. The representation and bolt boxes aren't used in this case, so their settings aren't important. For the appearance, set all of the colors to ghost and all of the line types to blank except for the reference line. Set that color and line type to your preference. Once done with that, save it if desired, then click Modify. This will show all of the reference lines for all of the main parts of the connected parts in the assembly drawing. I just hide the ones I'm not using. The work point for the gusset is the intersection of the bracing center line or reference line and the welding surface which I indicate by placing a work point circle and then tie that point down to the left end of the beam. Next, I dimension the holes to the work point and to the center line of the brace using the Parallel Dimension command. After that comes the bevel, making sure I have Ortho Mode enabled. The last thing is to spruce up the part mark a bit to indicate the plate is centered on the flange. I also have a save setting for this too. Lastly, we arrive at the single part drawing. Here you can see the typical drawing that is produced for this type of plate. I find that these dimensions locating the holes are somewhat cumbersome and not the most accurate way to physically lay out the holes. So I'll delete those and add back something that makes a bit more sense, at least in my opinion. Like the assembly drawing, I'll use the neighbor part setting in the view properties to set the reference line for the brace. Then I'll draw the work point circle, tie that down from the brace side of the plate, and start dimensioning the holes, again using the Parallel Dimension command. 
I finish by popping on a bevel, making sure ortho mode is enabled once again. Another thing to note is that I don't prefer to close my dimensions for plate cuts. I believe there's a setting that controls this, but I normally let Tecla Structures go ahead and dimension everything and then I'll keep the dimensions I want and discard the ones I don't. I find that way works best, at least for me. I tie all of the dimensions down to one common point. For this type of gusset, that's this corner where the work point edge intersects with the brace side of the plate. For all intents and purposes, the size of the plate and the location of the node points are generally not important. It's more important that the holes be located accurately and then, in turn, the plate can be accurately located on the beam or column to ensure proper alignment and good fit up in the field. That was a lot of information to go through rather quickly. Believe me, I know. But that's the beauty of YouTube. If you didn't catch it all the first time, just rewind it and watch it over and over. I don't think you're going to wear it out. I tried to highlight all of the points I thought were important, but I know that I left out a lot of details along the way. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comment section below this video, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. If you don't have any questions and you just want to leave a comment, you can do that too. You can leave me a message on the Tecla forum under C.S. Wilson or contact me on social media using the links down in the description. So that's going to wrap up episode two of Tecla Tech Talk. I hope you found it informative and if so, please give it a thumbs up. And don't forget, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. And while you're doing that, you can get notified when I release a new video by clicking on the bell next to the subscribe button. So that's it for this one, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.